everyone. This is Jennifer, the Inquiring Quilter, and I'm glad that you could join me today. Um, today's topic is going to be quilting with the teeth. And I can't wait to share that with you. But while we are waiting, um, please uh, go ahead and comment so I know that you're there. Say hi. Um, maybe share where you're from. Uh, I'm from Indiana which is in the farm belt of the United States. And here, we're starting to see signs of spring. Um, I'm seeing the birds making nests. I'm seeing the leaves starting to pop out. I'm smelling the uh, hyacinths and the uh, tulips and the magnolias. And spring is definitely in the air, although we are still being nipped by winter. So, um, I, oh, hi, <laughs> yay, somebody liked me, <laughs> Um, I'm still a little bit new to this live business. Um, I'm uh, doing this on my computer this time instead of the phone, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to say comments or not, but um, I will try to react to those if I can. And um, again, we'll just wait a few minutes to see if everybody is uh, joining us. Oh, hi, Cindy. Oh, it's Captain. Yay. Hey, you're in my neck of the woods. Oh, hi, Pat. Yay, I know exactly where you are. <laughs> hi, Tina. Yay, good. I'm glad to see you guys are there. Thanks. I was starting to figure out, can I can I see comments or not see comments? <laughs> so thank you. Thank you a lot. <laughs> um, aw. And while we're waiting, just a, another few minutes, um, please take a second to heart this video. Um, this really does something with Facebook and, and lets me get a little bit bigger audience. And then if you don't mind, hit that share button. Um, that helps too, and uh, you have quilty friends, and they might want to know about the teeth as well. Hey, Peggy. Hi, April. Oh, Maureen. Hi. Yay. Oh, Canada. Whoa. Hey, love that. Thanks. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, I thought I'd start today by uh, answering a very common question which is, what is a batik? Um, the word batik refers to the way in which the fabric is dyed. Um, but let me show you what some batiks look like. Take this one, for example. Um, it's very tone on tone. That's kind of a thing that you can look for in batiks. Um, there's a very subtlety in the differences of color, but there's a lot of play there, a lot of lights and darks throughout this whole fabric. Um, so that's one thing that you can look for in a batik. Uh, notice that it's kind of almost a watercolor effect. That's uh, also indicative of a batik and something that I love about them. Let me show you another example. This one is very similar. Again, it's tone on tone. But if you notice, there is an overprint or uh, an image printed on it. In this case, it's a fern. Here, let me hold it a little bit closer. So that's another example of a batik. But batiks don't have to be one solid color. Like this one, they can be multiple colors. And again, notice how it's kind of almost like a watercolor. Remember that from childhood, kind of throwing paint on a canvas and having it blend? That's something else you get with batiks. In this case, there's yellow, there's blue, and there's red. Um, and what I love is depending on where you cut it, you're going to get different types of colors. Another thing about a batik is the way that they're dyed, they are immersed in the dye. So what that means to you is that the front side of a batik is very similar to the back side. That's because the dye penetrates the fibers. Now, what is not a batik? This is not a batik. Doesn't mean it isn't great. It's a great quilting cotton. It looks similar. It looks similar to a batik 
in that it has a subtle play of color. However, notice the backside. The uh, dye did come through a little bit, but not much. The way Coolden cottons are made, um, typically, uh, I think of them as being printed on the top, almost like a newspaper. And sometimes, yeah, the ink will bleed through. But it won't be the same as you get with a batik, where the color is on the front and the back. Now, batiks do not have to just be a color. They can have printing on top. For example, this one, which has my favorite colors in it. Um, this one has was first dyed in kind of a watercolor effect with green and blue and purple. And then, if you notice, there's tiny little dots on it. Those dots add texture. And the way those dots are applied on a batik is by using wax. Um, wax resists or prevents the dye in this, the second dye bath from getting on the fabric. So let me explain. Take this one, for example. If I hold it close, you can see that there's some subtleties in that blue. So let's pretend that what they did was they, they dyed this, this dark blue first and did it a couple of times so that they got subtleties in that dark blue color that the deer is. Then they applied wax. And the way the wax can be applied on a batik of various ways, um, they can paint it on by hand. They can also stamp it on. Uh, the stamps, by the way, are called the chops. And the chops are sometimes hand carved. Anyway, so they created a stamp that looked like this deer. And then they dipped that stamp in wax and then stamped it all over the fabric. And then they dyed it this light blue color. And where the wax was, it didn't penetrate. So it prevented um, the light blue from getting in those areas. After they do that process, they then boil the fabric to remove the wax. And the boiling process is what shrinks the teaks just a tiny bit at that point and also gives them that very tight weave that they are known for. Let me show you another batik. I just can't show you enough batiks. Um, this one is uh, a lot of different colors and then again they overprinted it very subtly with kind of a ferny pattern, a leafy pattern. This one, again, lots of different colors. Printed almost with dots and branches. Now, something you may not know about batiks is that they can also be solid. Um, I am an Island Batik ambassador, and for years now, Island Batik has offered solid batiks. For example, this one. They also offer a solid gray, beautiful gray, and also a solid black. Um, the purpose of the, the solids is so that you can create that more modern look that you may be looking for and have your batiks um, contrast against like the bright white or the bright black. Um, new this year, um, are uh, batiks in other colors as well. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble. Okay, so here's the uh, sampling of the batiks that I was sent in my box this year. Uh, includes bright purples and teals and greens and oranges, and those coordinate with the other fabrics that I was sent. But Island Batik actually offers um, a lot of different colors and solids. Um, let me show you something else about batiks. Um, I mentioned that they are the same in the front and the back. So basically there's no real right side, but if you look closely at your batik, you will see that there is a right side. For example, let me show you this one. 
notice how sharp and crisp the edges of the um, mousse are on this. Now, if you take, that's the right side. Now, if you take a look at the back side, you may sometimes see little tiny dots and a slight blurry edge to the image. Um, I don't fuss with that because really it's very subtle. And so for me, I treat the teaks as if the front and the back are the same because they basically are. So now I've talked about how batiks are made. Oh, and by the way, the word batik comes from Java or Javanese, um, and it means dot or to dot. And I think that probably refers to the way in which wax can be applied to the batik. It can be dotted on or painted on. So anyway, that's where you get the word batik. Um, now, a second question that people might ask is, uh, especially if you've never used batiks, why should I? Well, one of the benefits of using batik for me is the vibrancy of the colors. I mean, you really get rich, rich colors because of the way they're dyed. They're immersed in the dye. It's not just stamped on it's, or printed on, it's immersed. So let me show you some examples. This is my design sliced orange peel. And as you can see, it's really vibrant. And the batiks give the greens and the yellows and the oranges and the blues a lot of subtlety of color, a lot of light and dark tones. It kind of makes your eye dance around. Um, let me show you another example. This one is called uh, Sunset at um, St. John's. And as you can see, it is really vibrant. Those colors just pop. And I think you get that from the richness of the teaks. So that's a personal thing. Um, another benefit of using the teaks um, is for applique, especially raw edge applique. For example, here, um, this uh, is a quilt that I made when my little kitty Lucy died, um, and I just love it. Uh, and each of those pieces was just uh, traced and then cut. It's all raw edge applique. I didn't do anything to finish the edges. I just stitched, straight stitched the edges. And um, uh, they don't fray. Because of the density, because batiks are boiled and then they shrink and they're, they're fairly heavy, dense type fabrics. Um, not, a, not loose weave at all. Um, and because of that, they just really don't fray. So they're perfect when you want to use them for applique. Um, th that also makes them great for art quilts, you know, like this, um, because you can cut tiny pieces. You don't have to worry about them fraying. Um, it's great. Island batik, or batiks in general are really great for paper piecing. Um, I don't know if you try paper piecing. A lot of people don't want to try it because it's basically Words. I mean, you're, you're, you're piecing on this foundation, but you have to look at the window and then you have to check to make sure you've got everything in the right place. But when you use batiks, you don't have to worry about the right side or the wrong side or getting that part wrong when you're paper piecing. And I don't know about you, but that's happened to me. Um, but it doesn't when you use batiks. Here's an example of, of that I made of um, a table runner. This one was paper pieced. And again, so, so easy to paper piece with the teaks because you don't have to worry about putting right sides together or whatever. They're just, it's just gonna come out right when you do it. Oh, by the way, I forgot. If you have any questions while I'm uh, talking, please write them in the comments. And I will stop from time to time and check your questions and try to answer them right there for you. If I can't get an answer for you during the video, then, I mean, during the live session, <laughs> um, I will come back after the video is over and saved, and I will answer your comments then. Thanks. Um, here's, uh, let's see, oh, uh, another reason for using batiks is, again, you can kind of get that solid tone-on-tone -tone effect, um, like this one. Notice how this one, uh, it used, um, 
paper piecing. It also used applique, and none of those edges are fraying. I get a very solid, vibrant color of that little spider there. I call this one boo. <laughs> um, and, and that's because of the, the batiks with their rich color. Um, you can also get a very modern look. Um, let me show you this one. I call it Lake Cabot. I have to stand back for you to see this one. Notice the richness of the color. Also, you still see those sharp points. So there's a lot of contrast between the whites. And by the way, these, this is not white solid. These are uh, light colored batiks that I chose to use as the background. I made the background scrappy, just like I made the quilt. Let me back up again so you can see. Again, first time with this particular setup, so I'm not quite sure, but I hope that you're being able to see all the quilts and everything. Hi, Natasha. Hi, Connie. The leaf pattern. Okay, I'll have to go back and see if I can find the name of that uh, particular boutique that I showed, Lynn, and I will put that in the comments when I get to that. Um, I was talking about modern looking uh effects with batiks i love to put batiks with solid colors because the colors pop even more here's uh, another example um, i call this quilt uh, my little star and the patterns available on my website um, something else that you can get with batiks, and you can get this with a lot of other fabrics too, really, but um, you can cut uh, the motifs, the things that are printed on the batiks, and you can actually cut them if you want. Uh, take a look at this particular quilt. This one is called Hole in the Wall. And let's see if I can get the part I wanted to show. I don't know if you can see from this, it's called the Jewel Box Collection, and um, notice that over here, there's like a, a beautiful, it's, it's, like in, it's live, folks. Um, yeah. Notice that there's a, a really cute little octopus in there. Um, there's another octopus over here. There is some seaweed. Right in there, and then some mermaids. And you can fussy cut these, and they will obviously show up because there's a large, a deep contrast between that green, very nice sharp edge with the motif of the, of the mermaid here. Uh, let me step back and I'll show you the whole quilt. I think you'll You'll love the vibrancy and the, the colors that you see. Again, that quilt is called Hole in the Wall, and I'll have that particular pattern up on my website here towards the end of the year. Something else about batiks is because the threads are so dense, they don't really stretch when they're cut on the bias. So if you like to, to cut bias bindings because you like the strength of that, but you're a little tired of the stretch, uh, use a batik. When you cut it, it just won't um, stretch like that. Um, hmm, I wonder what I did with that. Live, folks. I had something else to show, but I don't see it. Um, uh, some batiks can look a little striped, so if you were to cut them on the bias, you could get a nice diagonal stripe effect. And I'll try to see if I can find that and put a photo of that back up on the blog. Um, some things that maybe batiks aren't as good for. Um, I personally don't really have this problem, but I have heard that some people do not like batiks for a handwork um, because of the density of the threads. Um, like a hand applique or whatever. Um, 
or hand quilting. However, a lot of people do use them for both of those and they don't have a problem. I'll tell you what's probably what they're doing. Uh, just pre-wash your batiks and you won't really run into that problem. It will soften them if you find them a little bit too stiff. Just pre-wash them. Um, you don't really have to pre-wash batiks um, in order to remove excess dye um, any more than you would your regular quilting cottons. So uh, when you're talking about um, highly saturated purples, reds, blues, um, whether it's a printed cotton or a batik, you probably should pre-wash just to double check. Um, anyway, when you do pre-wash, it will soften it. So if you're planning on doing handwork with the batiks, that's what you can do. You can also just use a thimble. That helps too. Um, I also saw a tip online uh, where someone uh, took water and uh, fabric softener, so watered down the fabric softener and sprayed it um, on an area of her quilt where she was trying to hand quilt and was having some trouble and that softened the thread. So again, you can try those tricks. Now, another question that people get, oh, uh, let me show you a couple more examples of batiks. Uh, they don't just come in blues and purples, even though those happen to be my favorite colors. Here's some more. Look how modern that looks with the white and also how rich those colors are. Um, I call this honeycomb and I did it with hexes, uh, framed hexes. Um, here's something that's a lot more uh, dark and woodsy and warm, rich, warm fall colors. So you can achieve anything that you, any kind of mood that you want to achieve with the teaks. Um, just choosing the right kind. Oh, ha ha, look, I found it. Um, so when I was talking about batiks um, and cutting them on the bias, here's an example of something that kind of looks fairly stripy. And if I were to cut this for binding, it would look fairly stripy, but I can also cut it on the bias. That's the diagonal and achieve a kind of a diagonal stripe effect. In doing that with a batik, I'm not, this really doesn't stretch. It doesn't stretch like regular cotton, so I'm not gonna have that problem when I put it on um, a quilt, uh, assuming you're using bias binding for the strength and not to go around a curve. When you're trying to go around a curve, you do want that stretch in your bias binding. I'm so glad I found that. Okay, now to answer what probably is your last question, um, and that's, uh, can I mix batiks and regular quilting cottons? And the answer to that is, heck yeah. Um, I think of fabric as fabric. It's the paint that I use to make my quilts. So when you need a batik, use a batik. When you need cotton, you know, some kind of print or something like that, use that. The only tip that I would give you is that um, because, uh, again, think about how batiks are made. Um, they are more or less pre-shrunk. Uh, they're boiled to get that wax off. So um, your quilting cottons will probably shrink a little bit more. So if that's going to bother you, and frankly, it never has bothered me because I've mixed cottons and batiks all the time, but if it bothers you, uh, pre-wash your, your quilting cottons first before you mix the two in a quilt. Um, here's an example, rather easy example. Um, I wanted to create a shadow quilt. There we go. I think you can see the shadow effect. And I was pulling oranges and yellows and reds from my stash. Some of them are prints, some of them are um, batiks. And I wanted to find just the right kind of purple to set them on, and it happened to be a batik. So that's what I used. And notice how it's almost like they're floating above the background. I think that's because that batik that I use for the background gives it some kind of life. Um, here's another example. I wanted to make a quilt for my husband. He's from Oklahoma, so I wanted it to have Southwest color. I call this quilt Mirage, by the way, and the pattern's on my website. Um, I started by pulling this lovely southwestern print um, as the background. And then I wanted to have the rich uh, teals, 
the deep golds and the bricky reds. And so some of these are batiks and some of these are prints. I didn't really care what, I was going for the colors that I wanted in my quilt. So that's what I would advise for you too. Uh, I'll show you one more thing, advantage of using a batik and blending it. Um, look at this, how, how that iris, which a lot of these are just prints, uh, po really pops in that background that is very watercolory and very artistic looking. Oops, there it is. <laughs> um, and that's because of the, the subtleties that you get with the batik. So mix your batiks with your cottons. Feel free to do that. That works just fine. Let me check now and see if there's any more comments. Okay, great. I, um, I think that's all I wanted to cover today. I have part two of Quilting with Batiks on Thursday at 1.30, a slight difference in the time change, 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. At that point, I'll be talking more about uh, sewing with the, the tips that um, you need to know, uh, you know, what type of needle, what type of thread, should you pre-wash, should you not, blah, blah, blah. I'll cover that on Thursday. So be sure to drop back and see that video. And that's it for today. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate it. And again, um, let me just scroll up real quick and see if there are any questions that I didn't catch. Okay, so just the one about the leaf pattern. I will um, get back to you, Lynn, about that. Um, and I'll just say goodbye. Thanks for the hearts. I love it. Uh, again, you know, heart the video and, and uh, share it with that, that share button. And I'll see you on Thursday at 1.30.